for sunny after some brief morning cloudiness. You know, a major health problem sometimes arises when people start enjoying outdoor living and fall victim to sun o -mania. The northeast part of the United States lies parched under the worst drought to hit since 1930. It's a massive solar storm that's hitting Earth, the most powerful one in 19 years. Scientists rate it a G5, and that's on a scale of 1 to 5. Darkness is defined as the absence of light. An elegantly summarized idea, but lacking in proper context. Because even in the deepest darkness, light is present. You can't always see it. Or feel it, but it's there nonetheless. Absolute darkness is merely theoretical making the true definition of darkness more accurately stated as the absence of visible light. Light is simply energy, which encompasses a vast spectrum of frequencies and wavelengths with only a small portion being visible to the human eye. Light is the principal component for all life on Earth. Most importantly, the sun's light. Without the sun's full energetic spectrum, there'll be no life on Earth at all. History shows us that humans have readily acknowledged this for thousands of years. A little different than all the rest A quite old fashioned wear a hat, sometimes play chess And when I'm out, I'm looking for that vintage but all complexions that I adore So hard to find, they seem impossible to score So I dream of to some be find that vintage love On April 5th, 1815, the sun had just begun to sink beneath the horizon drawing long shadows through the Dutch coffee plantations of the Indonesian islands, and frosting the tips of everything with the familiar faint glow of sunset, when an explosion disturbed the evening. On the neighboring island of Java, Lieutenant Governor Stamford Raffles heard what he supposed might be merchant ships colliding at sea, cannon fire, or gunshots, and thinking the islands were under attack, the British authorities sent troops out to investigate and to conduct any possible search and rescue for those who might be stranded at sea after a disaster. Several hundred miles away on the island of Sumbawa, Mount Tambora had fully awoken and spent the next several hours spewing ash into the air, startling the residents of the tropical island who had only just realized in 1812 that Tambora was not simply a beautiful 14,000 foot mountain peak, but was in fact a volcano when it had unexpectedly begun to rumble. The troops, sent out to quell possible pirate uprisings or deter invading armies, returned back to the lieutenant governor to report that they had found no indication of either. During the following few days, the skies darkened as ash obscured the sun and confused things further until on the evening of April 10th at 7 p.m., an approximate 33 gigaton blast heard 12,000 miles away, ripped more than 4,000 feet off the top of Mount Tambora, sending three columns of lava and gases shooting 26 miles into the night sky, hurtling boulders through the air like an angry giant, and shaking the island violently as the top two-thirds of the mountain collapsed into a caldera approximately four and a half miles wide. A local dignitary who witnessed the event and managed to escape described the harrowing phenomenon as being like a body of liquid fire extending itself in every direction. In the initial blast, 11,000 souls are estimated to have perished as 8-inch pumice stones rained down and lava streams raced for the sea. Winds reminiscent of a hurricane swirled across the islands snatching at everything in their paths, plucking trees from the earth tearing up the buildings, and carrying away the animals and people. All of this was followed by a tsunami. In the aftermath, three feet of ash blanketed the earth, and aftershocks continued to rattle the island well into 1819. Meanwhile, the effects of the eruption of Mount Tambora had only just begun, as the ash and toxic gases deflected the already reduced solar energy of the Dalton Minimum away from the earth and back towards the sun 
effectively cooling the Earth's surface by 0.4 to 0.7 degrees Celsius, or up to 1 degree Fahrenheit. Sulfur pumped into the atmosphere increased lung diseases, and hydrogen chloride caused caustic precipitation to fall killing crops in the field. Strange storms filled with massive hail and winds further damaged crops and ushered in severe food shortages across a vast number of countries. This, coupled with the reduced length of the growing season in many areas, caused the price of food to shoot through the roof. With no understanding of why things were happening, grain markets and bakeries were mobbed by large groups of hungry citizenry, and food-related riots increased in cities throughout Europe. The incessant rain, unseasonable coolness, and lack of sunlight, combined with an undernourished populace unable to nutritionally ward off illness, such as cholera and typhoid, resulted in an increased spread of disease. It's been estimated that between 71,000 and 140,000 individuals perished as a direct or indirect consequence of the sun's being obscured by the Tambora eruption. By 1816, a volcanic winter had a large part of the globe tightly in its grasp, and an ice dam formed in Switzerland, while Europe and North America endured freezes into June and upwards of 13 inches of snow in August, prompting the title of the year without a summer. In China and India, residents fled their villages as floods swept through with the alteration of the monsoon season. In June of 1816, the unrelenting rain and gloom with volcanic origins forced Lord Byron, Mary Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and friends indoors on their holiday. At the behest of a bored Lord Byron, the group would compete to see who could write the scariest story birthing the Frankenstein monster and the precursor of Dracula. Visually strange sunsets and red fogs crept across the eastern U.S. coast, Canada, and Europe due to a haze which hung in the air for years following the eruption of Tambora, and artists began to enrich their canvases with red hues brightening their previously gloomy palettes. Painted landscapes, clouds, and sunsets took on a new radiance as the perception of color was altered by interference of high levels of tephra, or volcanic particulates, in the atmosphere resulting in a decreased transmission of the blue wavelengths of light, leaving a greater amount of the red spectrum observable. The fact that declining solar cycles like that which took place during the Dalton Minimum and increased solar flares have an influence on volcanic activity is no secret. The fact that sulfur dioxide naturally off-gassed from large volcanic events enters the stratosphere and mingles with water to form sulfuric acid aerosols that in turn reflect the solar radiation of the sun away from the Earth's surface, leading to the cooling of temperatures around the world, is also well known. Centuries after the catastrophe of Tambora and the resulting year without a summer, governments and privately funded companies are now racing to geoengineer solar radiation emanating from the sun in a bid to reduce Earth's surface temperature with the use of sulfur dioxide. To imply this is a controversial idea is putting it mildly. Given the potential catastrophic consequences of these actions and the lack of any agreement on who, when, or where this should be done, or even if it should. Well-founded public reticence and pushback have slowed or stopped many of the government-funded attempts to obscure the sun, but that hasn't stopped private companies who are willing to show up in any state or country to launch large weather balloons filled with sulfur dioxide and helium into the stratosphere at least six miles or more overhead. The problem is, due to the characteristics of the stratosphere, balloons launched in Silicon Valley of California can have effects on the weather over Madagascar. In other words, messing with nature has very real risks for everyone. And for what actual gain besides power, control, and money? As the benefits are questionable at best and potentially cataclysmic, at their worst. In the little house where the pixies definitely prefer the radiance of natural sunlight over the questionable presence of darkness, and where we have refrained from sending any gas-filled balloons into the atmosphere above the potager, no matter how tempting Louisiana summers make the idea, the sun has nonetheless recently come under the pixies' intense scrutiny. It was brought to their startled and somewhat disapproving attention that the sun was not just encouraging their plants to grow, 
gently ripening their vegetables and warming their days, but that it had had several explosive outbursts of late, which has in turn left them concerned about her overall intentions towards their plants, their persons, and the earth in general. Now, here it should be noted that because they are my progeny, they have been relentlessly subjected to long-winded discussions on light, the sun's energy, and the mechanism and systems affected by both over the years. And in these moments, they have been polite, but mostly uninterested captives in the conversation, wondering just how they came to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, so as to be subjected to such an abundance of mysterious words, all strung together in so great a volume as to make a pixie's head droop from the sheer amount of unsolicited information bombarding their brains. And this is not altogether unfair. However, that was until they woke up to meet the dawn one morning to discover that solar storms headed towards Earth had the potential to interrupt important things such as civilization as they know it, which they agreed seemed decidedly unpleasant. After all, pixies do not care in the least for darkness or disconnectedness, a trait I suspect we all share to some extent or another. Perhaps you may have noticed if you have ever had a child, or known a child or been a child, that children are naturally drawn to the light. Children imagine the darkness to conceal unidentified and disreputable characters, such as the boogeyman, under bed and closet dwelling monsters, and an array of strange creatures who have only ever been dreamt of in the active and limitless minds of children, as well as perhaps that of storytellers and Hollywood scriptwriters. They, children that is, and not the scriptwriters, embrace the sun's light not simply to avoid encounters with the things that might lurk in the darkness, but like cats, they are quick to seek out even the smallest illuminated patches to play in when left to their own devices, for reasons I am convinced are because their busy little bodies naturally crave the sun's energizing spectrum of light in an instinctive expression of their subatomic selves, which they haven't yet been taught to suppress. They just haven't gotten the message yet that the sun is damaging, a message which, in and of itself, is lacking in some context. Admittedly, a giant fiery ball of electromagnetic energy, powered by the continuous violence of improbable nuclear fusion, is obviously capable of immense destruction. However, its energy in all its forms is also how all life on Earth is transformed and sustained. I suggest that discernment, observation, and respect are the keys to understanding where the lines are drawn in any relationship. If we did not have the creation of sunscreen to block the evidence of damage to our biological systems when we have crossed the line from energy absorption to oxidation, we would instead limit ourselves naturally in our time spent in direct afternoon sun, as the pain of not doing so would remind us to adjust our behavior, one would hope, before more damage was incurred. But solar radiation is as imperative for life as breath. After all, we are made up of and held together by its electromagnetic energy. According to particle physics, approximately 98% of your mass is kinetic and potential energy, wrapped up in a presumably smart package that would suggest to the individual standing beside you that you are an entirely solid object. But on a subatomic level, you simply are not. You are actually far more empty space, with a particular amount of electrons and atomic nuclei bound together by electromagnetic energy, and even capable under the right circumstances of acting as a quantum wave. In a simplistic manner of speaking, you are primarily light. Now before you rush to the phone and start calling people who question whether you would ever amount to anything, you should probably know that everything on Earth shares this distinction at an atomic level, thanks to the energy that emanates from our star. The sun's energetic light hurtles outward through the vacuum of outer space in the form of electromagnetic radiation that's measured in frequencies ranging from 1 million 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 waves per second to a tamer 10,000 waves per second and moves towards us at 186,287 miles per second filtering through our multi-layered atmosphere and arriving 8 minutes and 20 seconds later to carefully deliver enough heat and light to maintain liquid water on the surface of the Earth, give your skin a sun-kissed healthy glow, and cause all life to thrive through its influence on the complex mechanisms of metabolism and redox signaling. 
The nuclear fusion powering our sun requires two proton waves to overlap and fuse together to create a deuterium nucleus. However, this is an intrinsically rare and entirely improbable occurrence for protons, as most often their waves cross only momentarily before they rush away, avoiding the transformative nature of fusing, much like an introvert hurrying to cross the street in order to avoid social interaction. According to Ethan Siegel, a PhD astrophysicist, the odds of this dance of proton waves resulting in fusion is about the same as the odds of winning the Powerball lottery three times in a row. Yet, because of the sheer number of protons in the sun, this successfully occurs enough times to power not only our sun, but practically every star in our universe. The odds for introverts of the world to be able to avoid unwanted small talk is fortunately for them far more favorable. Our star is also positioned a mere 93 million miles from our back door, sporting a hefty magnetic field which holds the planets in orbit is equivalent in diameter to approximately 109 Earths, having the mass of 300,000 times that of our planet, and though powered by the aforementioned relentless nuclear fusion, still manages to wake us in the morning with a cheerful, gentle glow and a pleasant warmth. Unless, of course, you've made your home in the Lut Desert in Iran or the Sonora Desert of Mexico. In either case, decisions were obviously made, and that one is squarely on you. Besides the familiar visible light and infrared radiation, plasma and solar wind particles which include gamma rays and x-rays and which are the result of solar flares and coronal mass ejections, i.e. CMEs, are periodically shot towards Earth as explosions of magnetized particles erupting off the sun's surface and are events that have the potential for cataclysm should they reach the Earth's surface maintaining the majority of their energy. Well, that sounds dangerous. Yes, well, while it has happened several times, in fact, according to geological record, it's obviously a rather rare occurrence. There is more to the story, because back here on our spinning rock, Earth's magnetic field generated by the flows of molten iron found at the outer core of the Earth creates a powerful electric current, which extends past Earth's atmosphere and shields us from the majority of the solar winds whose charged particles would otherwise deteriorate our protective ozone layer and wreak havoc on the surface of the Earth. Fortunately, Earth's atmosphere includes this layer, which is made up of trace gases that amazingly accounts for only three molecules out of every 10 million molecules of air, and despite being terribly outnumbered, still manages to efficiently absorb radiation particles, including close to 98% of ultraviolet radiation or UV light, just like a sponge. Depending on how many experimental projects are officially unacknowledged over your location, how many entirely natural clouds are covering the sky, or what environmental pollutants are hanging in the air above you, you might be able to look up at the beautiful electromagnetic filled sky and witness Earth's atmosphere efficiently scattering the ordinarily weak short blue wavelengths of sunlight overhead and forcing them to take center stage in a brilliant gradient Meanwhile, out of your view, the Earth's magnetosphere traps the more harmful waves of energy in the Van Allen radiation belt, deflecting it away from the Earth's atmosphere like a shield. For millennia, individuals have looked to these same skies to distinguish the time of year, day, and even hour by her changing light. Numerous mythical stories from ancient cultures worldwide depict the heroics of the sun gods and the essential nature of sun to man's existence. The people of ancient Egypt understood the rising sun each morning to be a declaration of victory over the massive serpent Apophis by their falcon-headed man-god Ra, who piloted his solar-powered barge across the sky daily before diving into the underworld at sunset and warding off the recalcitrant beast, whose sole goal in life or afterlife was to kill Ra once and for all plunging humanity into eternal darkness and subjugation by preventing the sun's rising. He seems nice. Because the ongoing animosity between the two, I'm betting tucking the tiny Egyptian pixies into bed took more than a few stories, several requests for water, and 11 bathroom trips. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure co-sleeping was invented in ancient Egypt thanks to this delightful tale. This, however, is merely a supposition on my part. 
Either way, night was fraught with danger as the inhabitants of the world awaited the evidence that the god they referred to as the self-created one, who had stood in the midst of swirling primordial waters of chaos, establishing order, and who they firmly associated with life-giving energy, would once again gain the upper hand against his foe and show up right on time each morning like clockwork. Because of the sun's established consistency, the people of Northeast Africa used the energy radiating from their solar god as he traversed the sky to grow not only their agrarian dynasty, but to establish advanced mathematics, conceptualize time study, and used astronomy to precisely position their architecture. Meanwhile, some 5,000 miles away, 10 three-legged sunbirds perched lazily in a tree. According to the ancient Chinese custom, each one awaiting their turn to travel around the world in a carriage driven by their mother. But the feathered offspring of Di Jun, god of the eastern heaven, became restless, and bored of their daily routine, they decided to rise all at once and traverse the skies together. Their combined rebellion brought intense heat, which destroyed crops, dried up lakes and ponds, started fires, and caused the entirety of humanity and animals to desperately seek shelter or die of exhaustion. The Emperor Yao stepped in for his people and pleaded for divine intervention from the father of the unruly sunbirds. But Di Jun had already taken notice of his disobedient offspring's behavior and had sent an archer to threaten them and bring them back into line. When the arrogant three-legged son of a guns refused to be brought to hand, the archer in his anger shot each one of them out of the sky until only one remained, prompting Emperor Yao to put a stop to the archer's murderous spree by reminding him that the earth needed sunlight, or it would be plunged into darkness and every living thing would perish. The archer, who had run out of arrows, acquiesced, and the remaining sunbird, who clearly got the message with the violent loss of his brothers, behaved impeccably from then on, rising and setting without fail, and with such precision that once again you could set your clocks by his journey. Incidentally, in 725 AD, a Buddhist monk and mathematician, engineer and astronomer, Yi Xing, did just that by inventing a hydromechanical, water-driven spherical bird's-eye view map of the heavens, which was primarily a water-driven astronomical tool that doubled as an intricately made clock filled with gold and bronze mechanisms, which chimed on the hour with a drumbeat marking the quarter hours though presumably not widely used as it was a bit difficult to market under that name. Neolithic Chinese villages managed the sun's energy by positioning their thatched cottages to face the south and catch the warm rays of the low winter sun, ensuring that when they closed up their homes in the evening, it would remain toasty. So effective was this method that thousands of years later, their progeny would study the movement of the sun over the entire course of the year and intentionally construct cities with main streets that ran east to west so that every home built along them would be sure to capture the southern sun's energetic rays. And again, the ancient Greeks reverenced the sun god Helios, son of the titan Hyperion, believing that he drove his radiant horse-drawn chariot across the sky daily but not to limit themselves, they also attributed light in the forms of intelligence and music to the deity Apollo, who they shared custody of with the Romans. The ancient Romans, for their part, referred to the sun god as Sol Evictus, who was, for all intents and purposes, a Latinized version of the Greek Helios. And in a lasting legacy, our modern words boast roots from both great civilizations, and include the words solarium, solstice, solar, heliocentric, and heliotrope, to name a few. Our old friend Socrates, who we all know by now has never shied away from offering his esteemed opinion on, well, anything, advised that buildings should be constructed to capitalize on the sun's heat in winter, and Aristotle expounded on this thought by teaching his own students to consider the position of the sun in both winter and summer when constructing their architecture to maximize the comfort of those within across all the seasons. And despite being terribly busy striking terror in the hearts of every village they encountered, the Norsemen or Germanic people managed to take a minute out of their pillaging to opine on their own version of the sun's story in detailed prose that saw the goddess Sol racing her fiery chariot drawn by two magnificent horses across the heavens on her celestial journey and holding her shields fallen between the earth and the sun to protect the earth from being scorched 
all the while being chased by the shadow of the wolf Hattie, who like old Apophis in the underworld of Egypt is determined to put a stop to the sun's rising by devouring the luminous soul. Every story depicting the sun's relationship with humanity seems to have commonality, if simply in the overall premise that light is the ideal, darkness represents evil or death, and one must have a constant awareness of the fragility of the balance between time and existence being connected to the sun's precise location and the Earth's position. A smidge closer, we burn. A smidge further, we freeze. The very concept is the fertile soil for imaginative narratives to be spun, or perhaps stories told to cement in the minds of the next generation the importance of the connection between the natural world and humanity. But what if that connection is severed, even unintentionally? Increased independence from nature through technological advancement and innovation has not come without sacrificing something sacred. Our connection and understanding of the natural world we inhabit and the quantum elements of life. This is definitely not where I subject you to a lecture on returning to the good old days, which, if you've ever read any history book at all, you know doesn't look all like sunshine and roses. In the little house, we definitely appreciate modern conveniences as much as the next guy, especially air conditioning, which holds a special place in the hearts of everyone living in the southeast in summertime, when the living's slow and easy because the heat is soul-sucking. But I digress. It's more about recognizing the rhythms of the natural world that our energetic bodies, whether human, plant, or animal, were created to respond to, and returning to a more symbiotic relationship. But while humanity seems to have a primal, instinctive understanding of the sun's importance in its rejection of perceived darkness, framing it throughout millennia as the depths in which evil lurks, and filling literature with the juxtaposition between dark and light as a representation of good and evil, something has clearly jumped the tracks in our thoroughly modern mindsets. And humanity's relationship with the most important source of energy in the known universe is currently on the skids. If the sun's energy is so imperative to the very existence of life on Earth, what could possibly have gone wrong to cause humanity's previously worshipful relationship with the sun to take on the characteristics of a bad breakup, complete with restraining orders and libelous accusations thrown out with reckless abandon? I suspect there may be too many conflicting interests interfering in the once rosy relationship, not the least of which has been the profit model of using the sun as a scapegoat for everything from cancers to climate change, with the end result being trillion dollar revenue streams in the forms of every kind of sun mitigation, flowing briskly into the already full pockets of someone. But what if the sun's energy isn't the real boogeyman it's been made out to be? What if everything in existence is light given mass? What if every part of you is made up of the very nature of light? If what you eat is simply light transformed, what if everything you touch emanates with frequencies derived from the sun? And what if the cells in all plants, animals, and humans are powered in one way or another by sunlight? What if the thread of the narrative regarding the sun's effects has been corrupted, and what you think you know about the sun is only part of the story, with the rest of the tale really being an electrifying love story between the creator and the creation, with the sun at the energetic center of it all. In our own journey to understand the sun, we have found ourselves fully entangled in the subatomic nature of light and are looking forward to sharing the often eyebrow-raising and intriguing bits of the story, to the best of our ability, in the upcoming videos which we have broken down into more manageable sections for our own sanity and to make it a little more digestible for the viewer. Our hope is to explore the interaction of the sun with plants and human physiology and the earth overall, and maybe restore our intended original relationship with the sun as we go about the business of being humans. Should you like to be informed when we upload the next video, please click the bell icon for notification. And we hope you'll like this video, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel to follow along with us as we continue to grow. Thank you for watching. See you next time. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day.
nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Psalm 121 